All right, now we're recording. Okay. Now the agenda is on the screen. So uh, with that, let's begin. Welcome to the Town of New Canaan Town Council regular meeting for Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. It is 7.02 p.m. and this is a virtual meeting held on Zoom. And I see over my right shoulder, simulcast live on channel 79. Those wishing to participate in the meeting should connect to Zoom uh, or um, they can dial in on channel 79. Agenda, let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I assume we have no Boy Scouts, right? No Boy Scouts. Okay. Um, do I have got yep. a flag? I got a flag, there we go. All right, that way. I pledge allegiance, allegiance. to the flag. The flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. and to the, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands. One, nation, one nation, under God, under God. God. indivisible, indivisible. With liberty, liberty, and justice, liberty and justice for all. For all. Okay, excellent. Take seats. Um, Rich Townsend, would you like to take the roll call? Certainly. Uh, Ro uh, Robin Bates Mason. Here. Tom Butterworth. Tom Butterworth, you're, you're Here. muted. Yeah. Liz Donovan. Here. Here. John Engel. Here. John England. Here. Mark Jimsky. Here. Steve Carl. Here. Mike Morrow. Here. Maria Naughton. Maria Naughton. Here. Am I muted? Yeah. No, no, you came through then. You're quiet. Uh, Christina Ross is not, I still think she's not here. Okay, uh, Rich Townsend here, Penny Young. Here. You have 11, that's a quorum. Excellent. So um, with that is, uh, the meeting is called to order. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is, uh, do I have a motion to add one item to our agenda? We'll add it as item number uh, three and push everything else. Oh, uh, no, I guess as item number four. So immediately following the public comments, uh, I would like a motion to add, to add this item. Boom, additional agenda item. Waveney House Courtyard and Landscape Restoration. Um, Approval of a project to restore the Waveney House courtyard and landscape. The project will include plant material restoration of walks and replacement of broken stepping stones, new hardscape to replace sandbags, irrigation, lighting, removal of dead, damaged, or dangerous trees by the town, installation of an allée of trees to define courtyard, and possibly a new front entrance sign. The project is estimated to cost $125,000 and will be entirely funded by the Waveney Park Conservancy, except for the tree work. Do I hear a motion to add this to our agenda as item four? So moved. Who was that? Sven. Okay, Sven made a motion. <clears throat> um, second? I'll second it. Rich. Rich seconds, all right. I need uh, three quarters of you to add it to the, to the agenda at the last minute, so raise your hand. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight hands. So uh, the motion passes, it's added to our agenda. Um, thank you. Okay. John? Uh, yes. Just so you know, uh, channel 79 is not covering our meeting. I'm they watching a, it. They have a board of finance meeting up there. Oh, that's not us. No. It'll, change, it'll change soon. They did okay. that. They did that the other night. They ran the board of finance, and then this kicked in a little bit later. Okay. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes for the April 20, 2020 regular meeting? So Mark moved. Jimsky moves that we approve those minutes. Was that Steve Carl shifting or making a second? Steve Carl makes a second. He's on mute. <laughs> he made the second. <laughs> All in 
favor, raise your hand. All right, John, Penny, Rich, Mike, Tom, Robin, Mark, Maria, Liz, Sven, and, and Steve, still shifting. Okay, the minutes are approved. <laughs> Sorry, guys. By the way, I think it's an automatic. <laughs> Okay, with that, we move to public comments. Members of the public are welcome to speak to the town council on agenda topics scheduled for review and or vote. Uh, speakers begin with your name and street address and uh, go ahead, please. Anybody raise their hand or hit the reaction button or, or blurt out that you would like to speak. Anyone wanna speak? I'm gonna unmute all. Anybody want to speak? No. Okay. All right. So there's no, uh, nobody wishes to speak. So we will move on to agenda topic, uh, the new agenda topic number four, which is uh, the Waveney Conservancy. Uh, who is our speaker tonight? Hi, uh, I'm Jane Gamber. I'm going to lead the discussion. And then we also are pleased to have Chris Shipper, who is a member of the Waveney Park Conservancy Board with us, as well as Caroline Garrity, who is our board chair. Um, Tom Stadler did a terrific job of a very comprehensive overview in his addition to the agenda, but I will just kind of go through um, briefly, the deck that you all should have received outlining the work of the Conservancy over the past years, pictures of existing conditions that we're looking to improve, an overview of the proposal that's currently on the table, and the drawings that you'll be able to see. At Are you able to share screen? I made you co-host, and Carolyn, in case you have visuals, if you share uh, your think screen. No? I think Tom is going to take care of I, I can do it or John, you can do it, either one. You go ahead. You go ahead, Tom. Okay, so great. You'll be able to show us visually. Terrific. So we'll just look at that first page where we see an overview of the projects that the Conservancy has undertaken, uh, a, amounting to just over a million dollars. The uh, two key projects which are um, in process right now, the Anderson Pond restoration has been fully funded by the Anderson um, the Foundation as well as input from the town and the Conservancy. The Jenny and Meadow, again, a joint uh, venture with underwritten by the Jenny and Foundation and working in concert with the town. The Parterre Gardens, with which we also worked with the Garden Club in addition to the town and the Conservancy. And then a lot of trail restoration. Uh, and the final thing being the summer intern program, which has been very popular among the high school students. So those projects um, have been about a million, oh, a little over a million dollars of investment in the Waveney property uh, by the Conservancy. Um, next, I'd like to focus on the proposal for the front of Waveney and bringing it back to its former, former glory. You're able to see from uh, the existing conditions photographs that we have a lot of work to do. Although it's been lovingly cared for, it's really lack of capital and the length of time since its last redesign that have led to the need for this renovation. Uh, from the sandbags and the window wells and missing and broken uh, walkway pieces, overgrown shrubs, holes where dead plantings have not been replaced. There is a lot of need uh, right there at the front of this town asset. We are delighted to have Jennifer Anderson as our lead designer undertaking this task. Uh, she's been, developed a terrific design plan for the renovation of the gardens and the courtyard in front of Waveney. The reason we chose her was based on her sense of design, a terrific reputation, a very collaborative approach, and her experience in tackling large projects. 
There are two key objectives she was, we are all trying to achieve. The first is to design a plan that enhances the beautiful Waveney House. And the second is to utilize a variety of plant material that is both aesthetically beautiful, but is sturdy enough to remain attractive through the rigors of a public park and building and is reasonably low maintenance. We're proposing dividing this project into two phases. The first phase is what you see on your screen, and that is the foundation plantings in front of Waveney. Just to orient you, the house is to the right, the port cochere is in the middle, and the small stone wall on the other side of the port cochere is um, to the left of the screen. The proposal is to uh, restore the the glory with plant material that's appropriate to the style of Waveney and is consistent again with the goal of minimal maintenance. We'll be restoring the hardscape, removing the sandbags, um, repairing broken slates, etc., irrigating the gardens, and then adding light lighting for both safety and to enhance the house for evening events. The next slide will show us the courtyard or the forecourt restoration, which includes removal of dead and damaged trees and those that are dangerous. And then the installation of the, the allay of trees to define the courtyard and lead guests to the house. And then a second phase, which is on the third, the next, um, the next sheet, is at the front entry, there's a low stone wall as you enter the drive. And the pos we would, in that case, add a low hedge and a definition of that space. Uh, if you have any questions, our timing you can see on there is to move ahead with the um, approvals processes with the hardscape and then move through as, um, as timing permits. So at this point, if anybody has any questions, we'd be delighted to answer them. Caroline and Chris will be jumping in um, to help out. It's Penny, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when I uh, uh, actually listened to your presentation to the Board of Selectmen, so uh, it, it kind of piqued my uh, interest in uh, connecting with the um, uh, Preservation Alliance folks, uh, because there had been some concerns when you're doing the Partier uh, Gardens. I wanted to be sure that there was really some communication going on, um, you know, with various um, concerned entity, shall I say, um, and I spoke with Rose, um, and she um, shared with me the uh, the plans from the 1917 uh, landscaping and was emphasizing that obviously, uh, you know, those were many, many, many years ago, and obviously, you know, plantings don't survive forever and ever and ever, um, but her, her main concern was um, that uh, there was consideration to uh, preservation of the Olmstead brothers design if we, uh, you know, are attempting to preserve Waveney Park as it was. Um, but that obviously, um, you know, some of the plant materials in the original design may not be as um, um, useful today uh, from a maintenance standpoint. Uh, and so she just wanted to be sure that, you know, some consideration actually had been given to the uh, Olmstead Brothers uh, design. So um, you, you listened to the Selectman's meeting, so you um, are familiar with that we are looking at this as somewhat of a hybrid design because the maintenance piece and the sturdiness of the plantings are both critical yeah. to the success of making this something that we don't have to be restoring every year. Um, the other piece of it, of course, was that the Laphams did have a very large um, full-time gardening crew. So sure. the designer looked at all the historical records. She did take into consideration what um, had been done historically. And so honestly, much of it is very different. There, 
is a, a nod to the Olmsted brothers design, but I think that you're absolutely right. Much of the plant material is um, very different, but the design component is one that they are working, she is working to try to at least honor that and at least have a nod to it. But I'll be honest with you, we are not able to restore the original planting design for maintenance, for plant material, and we now have deer, which um, mm -hmm. was back in those days. That's good. Uh, I have a, a second comment as well, and, and that is, you know, um, uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the building, you know, with the um, disability entrance, uh, that is all going to be uh, redesigned, and so you're going to work uh, in hand in glove with, um, uh, you know, what's going on there to. We are, thanks for bringing that up. I should have included yeah, sure. that. So that part we're waiting until all of that um, ADA compliance is complete before we're okay. able to do anything. But thank you for bringing that up. I should have included Great, because it, it's gonna really look nice um, uh, when, when that is um, uh, completed. Well, and that's, that whole side will look so much better too. Oh so. my gosh, yes, yeah, really. Yeah. All right, good, thank you. So, uh, I just want to compliment the Conservancy on the work you've been doing for the pond and the meadow. It's just spectacular. Uh, what a fabulous, fabulous job. Uh, the question, and I think on the um, Parterre Garden, I think that was before the town council about a year ago, and uh, I think we gave the green light to that. So That was three but, but, years ago. Three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. <laughs> a while ago. Only, only, only some of us can even remember. <laughs> um, but but as to this project, the the, um, the New Canaanite uh, did have a story about the, the I believe it's the cherry trees and the question about the naming and uh, how did you propose to resolve that? Um, I'll let Caroline uh, take that one. Yeah, so I spoke to uh, uh, Mrs. Brennan today, who's the daughter of Charlie Kelly, um, who the trees are named uh, were placed in honor of and the, the stone monument. We had a very nice chat this afternoon and uh, we are going to collaborate with her and over there are several options um, that I talked to her about and I think we were very pleased that we were going to um, get together with her and the landscape designer and decide how to move forward with the trees. Was it just the one family or, or is the other tree dedicated to someone else? I, I don't uh, really understand what the other tree is. Um, there is a dogwood outside the courtyard, um, but there are no dogwoods on the inside. So okay. we would not touch that dogwood. It's not in our plan to do anything about that. Okay. I have a question. What is the lifespan of the cherry trees, the ornamental? Because don't they only have a short lifespan as it is? Um, I, she told me that originally one tree was planted in memory of her dad. Um, he died in 1979 and the first tree was planted in the early 80s. And that died and then these cherry trees were planted like 11 years ago. Okay, because they have about a 15 to 20 year lifespan, the ornamentals. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, thanks. You're welcome. It's John. Am I muted? No. Uh, so it's John Engel. I can't tell on these plans uh, what it's what the whole plan looks like. I see the part around the uh, uh, entrance, um, but for instance, the part around the ADA compliant walks. Uh, we see the before the black and white pictures of the sandbags and the before, but, but really uh, the exhibit two foundation gardens and exhibit three courtyard, um, they, don't, they don't tell the whole story. Have you developed a full set of plans or is this just the beginning uh, of the plan? At this point in time, we have this, we have this drawing certainly in a larger format and much clearer than, um, my bad copy. The ADA compliant play, um, 
area on the plan, which would be down at the bottom of the page, is really at this point in time not being uh, drawn in in any sort of detail because we don't know where where that's ending up, where what the size of the ramping has to be. Apparently, it's not wide enough at this point in time, and it may have a pitch that's inappropriate. Yeah, so at this point in time, we're just leaving that side of it alone, and we'll address it when the the ADA compliance is complete. Correct. So and the, the sandbag this, picture that's on the screen now. Um, why? <laughs> I guess we're we're eliminating the sandbags, but what are we going to do there instead? Uh, is that we're, just to illustrate re regrading? No, it is more than regrading. Apparently, there were were water issues. It does need to be regraded, but when the rains would come down super heavily, even if it's regraded, it still needs a barrier there. So we would be putting mm -hmm. a stone barrier. Mm -hmm. Is In Tiger is Tiger on? Yes, I'm yeah. on. John. Or, or Tiger, um, yeah. would, it, would it be helpful if you described a little bit more what, what the plans are for that area? Sure, I was trying to, I was trying to find my, uh, my plans for uh, that area as, uh, as, as you guys were talking, then I could uh, circle through it. But um, let me see if I can find something from their presentation that would be helpful. Do you want me to make you a co-host? So you can share your screen. If I can find something that's helpful, yeah. yes, absolutely. Basically, uh, yeah, basically, basically, right up by the wall. Uh, get, by the actually, wall Penny, I got a picture. I got a picture. Do you want oh, me? Did to you? Oh, great! Super. Uh, you gotta, you gotta let me, you gotta let me share it, John. Done. Go ahead. I'm trying. All right. Can you? We see yeah. it. Got it. See this area here? Okay. So this is the western porch. Right now, the walkway is pretty close to this side. And it's going to be, well, I'm sorry, on this side. So it's going to be centered inside the western porch and then lead out. And you'll have a access way over to the house and then an access way over to the parking lot and then one coming from the parking lot across. So the thought is that we ask the, the conservancy to wait for this area, they can, you know, from anywhere from here over to the house proper, they can work on and we won't damage it, but just leave this area open. We'll come forward and do this work here, which ties in nicely with the materials that they're wanting to do. And then the plantings on either side, we'll ask uh, Jenny to come back and give us a plan for both sides. And then it'll be tie in all together. And um, at that point in time, we do have money set aside inside the project to uh, handle the landscaping and this work um, on the ADA side on the, on, in the Waveney project itself. So we had an allowance for landscaping and we'll work with the Conservancy on making sure that this, our work here will tie in with the rest of their work um, in and around the house. So it'll be, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll contract with Jenny and then she can give us a plan that is, will, is will basically be seamless uh, between the two. So that was the plan when I met with the Conservancy, that was the plan, basically leave this little area alone for us, we'll come in and we'll do it, and then we'll tie it all back in together at the end, and you won't even notice that there would be a difference later on. I think one of the exciting things about this, this new design is the grade coming off of the porch and then all the way down to where the driveway meets it is a similar grade of coming out of the um, new the back part of the town hall so it's 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 not a steep grade it's just a very uh, gradual what is it a three one um, um, yeah so so that um, it, it's it's going to look you know much um, more uh, dressed and um, compatible to you know the needs of um, individuals who have walkers or uh, wheelchairs. Right at, at present, you can't notice the grade change at the town hall when you come from the parking lot to the uh, to the side entrance to the large granite entrance. You can't really notice the grade change at all, and that's basically the exact same grade change we'll have here. So it'll be a nice kind of entryway or a walkway through and it 
if, even if you're not entering the house and you want to come into the western porch and then go to the back patio, it'll just be like you're strolling along a walkway. It won't, won't feel like you're going up a ramp at all. Can you talk about a little bit about the drainage issues? I mean, I, uh, I see the sandbags. I see how we're going to add all the ADA uh, ramps. And I just, I, I, I want to understand a little bit better the water management issues here from my experience with houses, it's a big concern. And I would hate to start planting all these gardens and then find uh, that we hadn't thought through the water management. So well, I think they've thought through the water management. The, really, the, the problem is that the planting beds are pitched the wrong way at present. So right now, they're pitching towards the house, and, and their plant calls for them to be pitched away. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that'll negate the need for the sandbags and what have you to work around there. So that, the, uh, all it is is just a minor regrading to try to push everything back away um, and get it out towards the uh, towards the, the driveway itself. And with that, we've actually installed some drains on the outside of the uh, portico share this past year to take it, which is on the inside of the lawn. So the water will shed across the drive and, and uh, be taken up. And if there is a problem, we can always drop a lawn drain in on the other side. But right now, they're just pitched the wrong way water's pitching towards the house instead of away you know so on it it's not on a daily rain but on a very heavy rain we have an issue that's why the sandbags are there other than that they, you know it's not a daily occurrence most of the courtyard the entrance courtyard is grass it's plain and i am imagining in the last couple of years when we've had caffeine and carburetors for example uh people park there Ferraris and their Porsches, and it's it, it's a it's a very versatile space. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, brides get their pictures taken on that grassy lawn, cars park on that grassy lawn, uh, all kinds of stuff happens because it's sort of an an empty blank space. And I'm wondering, is the plan uh, going forward once we remove those controversial cherry trees? Um, it's still going to be a, a grassy space and you're only adding trees around the periphery? We are just adding the trees around the periphery. The um, center courtyard will remain remain grass. And, um, and again, with the tree, uh, with the cherry trees and any other trees, they'll cer certainly uh, will be working with the family. Sure that um, the, the cherry trees are, are honored, that the, that the family is honored. And though, and currently, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to do this from memory from a caffeine and carburetors. Um, and I think that there were cars parked on both sides of the of the uh, pavement, and so now there are trees uh, on your plan where there where it is currently grass and and nothing else. Is that true? Uh, I believe there are some trees on Tiger. Maybe you can help us out or. Uh, Caroline, Chris, somebody who has a better recollection of what the existing conditions are there. Um, I, I won't speak to um, I won't speak to uh, what's there existing, but I would say that the way the uh, the alley is formed, that cars would also be able to park in between. There's enough spacing there, but the center courtyard would become much more open. And that is more consistent with the original design. So um, I, think we're, I think we're moving in the right direction on this one. I think the problem will be the trees on this image on the right side. I'm not quite sure what the state is. Those are outside the wall, but many hang over the wall. So the work will have to be done there as well. Yeah, I'm not even suggesting that this ought to be a place where people can park cars. You know. For, for Far be it for me to suggest that this place should be designed for caffeine and carburetors. I'm just trying to remember the different kinds of ways that this space has been used and the way it feels so open. There's so little vegetation, there's so little plantings that is really dominated by the facade of the house. And I'm trying to imagine it if it was darker or there was a screen of trees or there was, um, you know, I'm just trying to imagine it differently. 
Um, but it sounds like you guys are taking, you know, this design with great sensitivity toward history and uh, making it, you know, uh, very versatile use. So I think oh, I, the only thing I would add on the trees is that the intent is that they would be um, more of a columnar nature, not a, a spreading nature. So it won't be um, maple trees or anything that has a big canopy. It will be more like um, linden trees or London plane trees or something that is uh, much, that isn't grabbing the attention because the attention is the house. Are there any further comments? I think that it sounds great and I'm happy to allow the experts to you know, work with the plan, far be it from, for a committee to start to get into the details of your plan. Um, I think it's, you know, you guys are the experts. You're the conservancy. I'd just like to jump in and say, uh, you know, please honor the family. You know, Charlie Kelly did a lot for this town and, uh, and for Waveney. And uh, I'd be ashamed to, uh, to, to stop honoring that man. You're here. Here, here. I think Caroline's conversation today with um, Mrs. Brennan was a terrific conversation for moving forward in collaboration. I had a okay. question, John. Um, it's on the, the Waveney is on the national. You have to tell or document changes or anything to the landscaping. So the question is that Waveney's on the National Historic uh, uh, Register, and do we have to document the changes or seek approval? I, I don't think so. Um, it's a landscape. We, we encountered this with the Parterre Garden. The landscape is not on the National Register. Um, the house itself is, but the landscaping and grounds are not. So uh, we'll certainly inform whatever bodies are important uh, of a significant change because that is historically relevant but it we don't need any approvals from any other bodies okay hey john can i ask a quick question I, you know i love i love the uh, fact that we're paying attention to this and thank you to the way any conservancy for for getting into this I, I haven't prepared enough uh, for this presentation. I, I'd love to walk up there and really see it. Those cherry trees, is there, are, are we talking about cutting them down? Or are we gonna move them somewhere? Or is that just they've grown there and they're out, they outlive their useful life? Because there's so many great photos of those flowering in front of the house. I thought we would just trim them back and, and uh, keep them going. But I guess there's a, there's a need now to take them out of there. <clears throat> I, I don't know if you heard me say, Steve, but um, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Um, um, I talked to Mrs. Brennan, and those were planted 11 years ago. The original uh, gift in, in memory of him was one tree. So um, trees have been there 11 years, and we're going to work, We, you know, as, as maybe I said, um, before the park and rec meeting last week, we had no idea that those were memorial trees. This, the stone memorial on the ground uh, talks about Charlie Kelly and how long he was first selectman, but it doesn't mention the trees. So we did not know that. Um, so, uh, you know, we're gonna to talk to the landscape designer. She is very collaborative and we're gonna figure out what, whether we're gonna trim them uh, move them, um, leave them. I don't know. We, we're going to work on that. Okay. So, and then I guess there's a second tree there. I haven't done the research yet, but there, there possibly is a second tree, the Antonellos, or there's a family that's involved in the second tree too. So we just make, make sure that we've contacted everybody that that's involved here because it's, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, Steve said there was a dogwood, but I, that's outside of the courtyard. We're not touching that. We're not touching that, okay. Yeah, and as Sven said, I mean, Charlie Kelly, if you do some research on what Charlie did for the town, and, and I'm biased, obviously, because he's a relative of mine, but, you know, that, that guy did some absolutely amazing things for this town. So, you know, just, we just need to make sure that we respect 
the intention of, of putting that type of memorial up and, and, and honor it, that's all. Absolutely. Yeah, between Charlie, Pete, and Julius, uh, they really uh, did a fine job for this town. Can I share my screen? That is, my, is a drone shot of the area in question. So, so I know Steve wants to go visit, but, <laughs> um, and I don't know, can you see the video now? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're all very familiar with that area and uh, you know, I walk it 10 times, but I, I didn't walk it, uh, you know, 10 times a, a month here, but I didn't, I didn't walk it with the intention of looking at that space and changing it because I just take for granted that it, it's beautiful and it's there. And, but if you, if you walk it and sort of walk it with the plans to get an idea of what's going on, that would be helpful. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's, that's helpful, John. There you go. <laughs> And as you said, John, I mean, it's, it, it, we're, we're talking about Waveney House here, which, you know, you don't design it for caffeine and carburetors or for any, you know, this, I know the post-prom uses it. They, they have, we set tents up outside there every year for the kids to queue up and that area is used a few times a year. But, you know, it, it's still, no matter what, it's the front entry that's the gateway of that, that house. And it's got to be respected and done right. And, and if it wasn't the Waveney Conservancy doing it, you know, I, I certainly want a, a bigger voice in doing it, but I completely trust what they're going to do. So uh, they, they certainly have my vote of confidence, especially with the work that they've done so far. So it cuts off the bottom a little bit, but you can see there is what looks like a little bit of a birch there, but, but a whole lot of green space. And it didn't look like you were filling up that green space. There are two maples, at, uh, I guess, on the lower left, and those are coming out. Yes? Yes. Correct. And that's a really nice looking roof. <laughs> that is a good looking roof. Look at that pretty garden. You can, t you can almost date this from where the, the progress you're making on the, uh, on the, that's on amazing. the I hope you've all been down to see the pond. It's almost finished and it really looks quite beautiful, I think. And we added um, the wood fencing around the spillway to match the observation pier. And they just put that in this week. So I hope you can all go over and see it. And I was over there yesterday working uh, on the long range plan for the next five years of the Conservancy with a landscape designer. And I was there with Chris um and there were so many people there it was so exciting to see i saw a mother with two little boys and their um their frog net and their bucket going down to the pond and people with bikes and it was very exciting to see so any other comments i mean now that you can i don't know now that we can see what we're talking about a little bit that is a helpful perspective john Oh, and there's the plaque and the stone, and that's going to remain or be moved, perhaps? Uh, I think it's a, I don't know if there's a plaque, it's, 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 uh, it's all it's a plaque it's a, on that rock. It's a plaque on the rock, okay, sorry. Yeah, um, and that's what Caroline agreed with Mrs. Brennan, that, that we would work collaboratively on how to best um, ensure his legacy. Gotta love that roof. <laughs> You've been quarantined too long, Sven. <laughs> oh, way, way, way too long, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Such simple pleasures we glom on to. Caroline, I have heard the same thing about the pond and the bridges, the new bridges and the ability to walk around the pond. I've heard so many people comment about how great it is, how great it looks. So hats off to the Conservancy. It's just amazing what we've done so far. Thank you. Do we need a motion at this point? I think we have, um, yeah, we need a motion to approve. Motion to approve. I'll second it. All right, so do we have, um, there's the, mo you can all see the motion on the screen. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're approving. May I just wait, make one suggestion? Uh, the 
Last word of the first paragraph should be design, not sign. Design. Okay. It needs a D in front of the sign. Correct. Yep. So do, does somebody want to read it or are we good? Uh, no. Nope. We don't have to, Tom. I already read it earlier. You already read it, yeah. Okay. So Sven makes a motion. Do I have a second? Steve. Steve, okay. That. Any discussion? Okay, there being none, I'm going to stop sharing and say all in favor, raise your hand. So I see John, Penny, Rich, Tom, Robin, Mark, that's six. Maria makes seven, Liz makes eight, Sven is nine, Mike is 10, Steve Carl is 11. So 11 out of 11, it passes. Thank you, Waveney Conservancy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for your time and your support. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your work. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> uh, You're not gonna stay for a meeting? Oh. <laughs> Do you want us to? It's up to you. <laughs> I have to go make dinner. <laughs> I have to go feed all my refugees we have here. <laughs> Thank so you. Does so the much. first selectman want to make an update? Thank you. Thank you. Where is Kevin? He's Maybe muted. We'll He's muted. There he is. All right, unmute. He's still muted. I can't unmute him. Um, what if I make him co-host? There I go. There he goes. There you go. Good. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'll give you the same update that I gave to the Board of Finance. Um, I work mainly on COVID-related matters. Um, doesn't take all my time, but it takes a lot of time. Um, as you know, a lot of you know, um, about a month ago, I asked Tucker Murphy and Bill Walbert to create an advisory committee, a private sector advisory committee. And that committee has been meeting um, since then, Monday, Wednesday, most Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the focus was, you know, this was before the governor had issued a uh, recommendation that towns and cities create uh, reopen committees. And um, th this wasn't geared toward reopening so much as what could we do to help downtown retail and restaurants survive and, and get through this crisis and come out the other side still in business. And uh, so we, we have about 15 or 16 or 17 um, representatives of restaurants and landlords and um, various segments of the business community downtown, we have bankers and accountants. And, and uh, so they've been focusing on what can the town do and what can private individuals do to help the businesses downtown. And um, as you know, the town had already, through your action with the tax deferral, <clears throat> um, the uh, the town um, had given rent relief to our um, town-owned properties, the seven seven lessees, and um, so we talked about rent relief. And I've I've talked to a few landlords. Most of the, the landlords are, are working with their tenants to <clears throat> give relief um, for April and May, and uh, perhaps June. Um, and um, the town has given free parking for the opening and we'll see you know, for the indefinite future. Um, and um, then the governor came out with his uh, reopening plan for outdoor dining with restaurants. <clears throat> and about three weeks ago, we started working on that because it largely requires the town to make the sidewalks available for the restaurants to uh, expand, spread out the outdoor dining they they may have had under a patio permit from the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. And uh, a plan was put together mainly by Tiger and Tucker and uh, John uh, 
Federico, um, Deputy Fire, uh, Police Chief. And um, that plan was approved last week by the Police Commission because we are basically taking away some areas of parallel parking on Elm and Forest and Main Street to allow the restaurants to bump out and use the sidewalk. And we will use the parallel parking lane for, for, uh, for pedestrian walking. So that required us to go out and order last Friday um, plastic barriers of the type that are being used in town at the, at the 42 Locust Project. They're white and we ordered them and they just arrived about two hours ago at the um, highway garage, highway department. Thanks to, um, to uh, Tiger and Mo Zachary and others. Um, uh, we'll be able to install those tomorrow and meet um, the Friday uh, goal of having restaurants open on Friday um, with outdoor dining. This, this group also did a survey. Actually, it was their idea to do a survey. The town did the survey. We sent out a survey and have gotten feedback from about 65 um, uh, businesses downtown. Very interesting results. Um, one of the members of the committee um, had suggested we, he, he wanted to take upon himself to uh, uh, recruit consultants to provide free consulting of, of business uh, advice and e-commerce advice. And uh, so um, about half of the respondents said they would welcome, would be interested in pre-consulting. Um, the sentiment for the uh, downtown respondents was that um, on a scale of one to five, um, a good 40% of them are convinced they'll be here by the end of the year. And some were a little more doubtful at ones and twos, but um, on, on balance, the downtown community is, is uh, optimistic and, uh, and uh, working hard within the constraints to survive. So that um, effort is ongoing. We also have a small effort to uh, talk to the seven or so national chains that are in town, such as Ann Taylor and Ralph Lauren and uh, to make sure that they're not on, a, you know, they crew file for bankruptcy at the national level, and you don't you don't want to be on the list of stores to be closed if you can avoid it. So we have a former research uh, analyst from Wall Street that's reaching out to these national uh, chain stores and seeing if we can uh, lobby for why people ought to keep the stores open in uh, in New Canaan. So that's the kind of effort this group has been doing. I, I'm very appreciative of their advice. And John was, has been on, on those calls and, and uh, Rich has been on those calls and uh, John Goodwin for the Planning and Zoning Commission has been on the calls. And so we, we really appreciate the private sector giving us this advice and helping us save downtown. Um, uh, town hall remains closed, even though office buildings that were, well, you know, three things were allowed by the governor's order to open today, uh, retail, uh, restaurants, outdoor dining, and um, offices. And um, we're gonna keep town hall closed to the public for a while longer into June. Some town employees are coming back to the, to op the uh, office. Um, those, a lot of town employees will continue to work from home. And uh, Tiger brought most of his uh, public works and highway staff and park staff back uh, today to get out there to mow the grass. And um, so we, we're working on a plan uh, and instructions for <clears throat> the overall plan to, to uh, bring employees back to normal. As you know, we've been doing testing. Um, we tested all first responders last Friday. We tested town employees on Monday and this week. And uh, we're gonna do uh, complete the testing of employees. Um, next Tuesday, we're gonna begin community testing. There'll be more uh, information coming out about that. The idea is to get a, a good perspective on where our, our profile stands with respect to the virus. I would emphasize overall, you know, as we report, <clears throat> Mike tends to report the, uh, the gross numbers as being 210, but in that 210 uh, uh, people who have tested positive, these are reported tested positive, and either tested into Canaan or, you know, if, if you have a 06840 zip code, we have some residents out who were out in te Texas and got tested in Texas and their results come back to uh, Canaan. 
but we have um, uh, 29 of the 210 have passed away. 21 of those at the Waveney Care Center. Um, obviously, most of the of the the victims of this virus are over 85 years old because it's very serious if you have comorbidities and uh, are in a uh, nursing home. And then 30 of the, or so of the two, 210 are, are employees of either Waveney Care Center and or um, Silver Hill Hospital who have tested positive in the past six to eight weeks and do not live in town. So we come down to about 150 to 60 Residents, which is a relatively known low number, we get weekly reports uh, from the state as to each town, and uh, we have 3,000 positive cases in Stanford and 1,500 in Norwalk, and um, so having only 150 or so cases in New Canaan speaks to the early action we took to to uh, encourage people to uh, stay at home and uh, shelter in place, and uh, the lack of community tra transmission that we really avoided by taking those actions. Um, Linda will address the budget. Things are, have been slowing down when you close down buildings uh, and you have uh, programs with part-time employees and stuff that are not going on. There are savings both on the town side and the Board of Ed side. The Board of Ed had indicated they may save as much as three quarters of a million dollars in the, in the last uh, few months of the year. Um, the town will save, as Linda will explain, net few less, but we're also on the town side getting a uh, hurt with our revenues on various scores, the uh, buildings uh, department, the uh, parking department. So, um, but on balance, we're going to have uh, substantial savings in the final months of the year. Other than COVID, I, I've been working on some projects downtown to retain some businesses and to do some possible asset sales. We've been working on with the Board of Finance and um, we'll have some news on those fronts soon. Uh, and otherwise we uh, are working on installing the uh, combined heat and power plant. We got the approval of Eversource to bring gas to the wastewater treatment plant and the highway garage for nothing. We, we were glad that they saw the value in, in generating electricity at the uh, wastewater treatment plant. And uh, so they're, they're not gonna charge us to bring that uh, pipe into the wastewater treatment plant. And we also work with Eversource to define their expansion plans this year. As you may know, they have had the uh, hookups um, uh, delayed because Pura, the, their regulatory agency, their regulatory body won't let them do um, expansion during the crisis. And, but they are allowed to do the re resiliency project down 123, which is going quite fast. That's a 12, uh, that's a, like a $9 million project to bring the pipe from New Canaan back down into Norwalk. So it's now a loop coming from the Stamper system up through Darien, through New Canaan, and then back down to Norwalk, which gives them re resiliency in their, in their supply of gas. And then finally, I've been working on the, the, uh, the library MOU, I'm talking to the library. I expect we hopefully will have that to the Board of Finance and Town Council in June. I'd be happy to take questions, but that's basically my report. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for all you've been doing. Thank you, Savannah, I appreciate that. It's a busy time trying to keep up with governor's orders. Since we just talked about Waveney, are we, uh, going to be taking up Waveney or the library in the next month or so, or is that being pushed back? Decisions on non-essential capital is still pushed back beyond next month. Well, as, as Linda, uh, and I, I see Sandy Dawson's on here. Um, Sandy Dawson's our bond council. Mm -hmm. And um, as will be explained when you look at the East School and Bridge um, bond resolutions tonight, you have to, in the emergency, the, governor, the governor's order indicates that um, things like appropriation, special appropriations and uh, capital projects that would otherwise go to a vote of the town or a referendum um, have to be approved on the basis that they're needed. 
in the emergency. There's language in paragraph 11 of your bond resolutions that you have to make a finding that's needed. So the two projects that you're being asked to approve tonight, we believe meet that criteria. Uh, Sandy can explain that or Linda can explain that. And uh, the other projects, um, it's not clear that they do meet it. So um, it, uh, they spaced out the resolutions to come in June and July. And uh, you, you don't have a meeting schedule, I believe, for August. But um, I think the governor's emergency uh, order runs until September 9th. So um, my anticipation is that the library resolution would not come until July um, uh, or afterwards. and. Um, most of the others, um, it's really a question of whether you think people would want to referend, re referendum some items. I mean, most of the garden variety purchases of uh, vehicles and school projects are something that probably are not controversial and we wouldn't expect people to want to referendum things that are needed in the ordinary course. But anyway, so that's a long way to answer, John, John, to your question. I don't think people are looking at referendumming vehicles and small capital, but specifically the Waveney, which is multi-million, and the library, multi-million. And that's why I wondered whether you expected us to see it in a month or two. And your answer is, according to the governor's latest, you know, last directive, the answer is no. That's why we're seeing bridges tonight, not libraries, right? Right. But then the, the, the decision you need to make is whether or not um, uh, you think it's likely that a referendum would be asked for and whether or not you have to weigh whether or not it's really a necessary project to get done. So anyway, Sandy can explain that further. I don't want to be the explainer of that. Any further questions for Kevin? Thank, there being none, thank you, Kevin. Thanks for the report. I guess next on our agenda, let me pull it up is da, da, da. proposed ordinance. Mark and Steve, take it away. Yeah, so thank you, John. The ordinance committee met um, and presented to the Board of Finance the idea of a recruitment and retention mechanism for volunteer uh, fire and, and ambulance. And uh, it went very well. The Board of Finance was very uh, receptive. Uh, Russ Kimes made a presentation along with Phil Shibley. Sven was Sven was in attendance, uh, as well as Mark, myself, and Mike Morrow actually uh, took the information and called it into a, a, a very readable, very organized document. So um, we'll get a copy of it out to everybody. Uh, we really wanted to just give you an update on the fact that we presented to the Board of Finance and that the, the update went well. The biggest question that came out of the uh, meeting was the health uh, insurance uh, clause, which uh, was asked about you know, part of the clause in this uh, ordinance is, is the ability for some the members, the volunteer members to be able to opt into the town's insurance at a full price. There's no, there'd be no cost to the town, but it would be an opt-in full price, you know, in, in excess of somewhere in the 22 to $25,000 area. Uh, the Board of Finance wanted us to discuss it with Cheryl and obviously have Kevin involved and make sure that by adding additional folks to the health care policy the town has that our cohort uh, would be in better position than we found it pr prior to that. So uh, we're just we're investigating that now. We're going to talk to Cheryl and hopefully by June we'll be coming back to the full council with you know, a recommend, recommended ordinance to pass. So uh, that's kind of where we are. Uh, Mark, if you want to hop in or Sven or Mike, just hop in and uh, you can add to anything if I've forgotten anything. I, I just think, uh, Steve, maybe you want to mention how many people they thought would opt in on the health care plan. I think it was a small number, maybe two or three is what they were thinking, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, was, that's oh, Go ahead. It was two on the, uh, on the volunteer fire side. Mm -hmm. And that's only possibles. That's nobody has sat there and said for sure. Right. Yeah, and I think you know it's important that we look at this both now and in the future. So we have to look at sort of the the low end and then the potential high end of this. But it's 
at the at the price of entry annually in the 20 plus thousand it's unlikely that a lot of folks are going to take advantage of that um but we just have to look at the numbers and make sure that it's agreeable with cheryl first off kevin obviously and then you know we'll probably want to get together with our uh, carrier too just to see you know what the ups and downs are so we'll, we'll come back with a report um you know and either tighten the language up or or figure out you know next steps that's where we are at this point you think that's a month out or further? I think, you know, it's, I'd like to say it's a month out. Normally, I'd say it's a month out, but it's so difficult right now to get anything. You know, normally, I would just be popping into town hall and sitting down with Cheryl, but it's not that way anymore. So you got to schedule things, and it's just it's amazing. We don't, we don't uh, move with lightning speed as it is, and this has definitely slowed things down to another notch. So um, I hope to be back to, to, uh, in a month, but we'll see. Steve, do we know that zero subsidy, is that a requirement of state law? Is that the only way we can do it under state law? Because my, my question is, if it's gonna cost 20 to $25,000, it may not be perceived as a, as a very valuable perk. Sven, what do you think about that? I mean, some of the, some of the feedback that Russ and Phil got, specifically Russ, I think, some of these guys are, either you know electricians landscapers traditionally um, have side jobs but they don't have the full health care that they'd like to have and this gives them an option if they were to opt in to, to let them have access to a, a very comprehensive plan that would maybe less expensive than going out on their own and, and doing it on their own but I, th I think that's sort of the feedback that we've gotten Sven, Sven or Mark do you remember what the uh, feedback was no no it was exactly no. that I think we'd, we'd have to go back and, uh, you know, and under the ordinance committee and then uh, see if we can get an, um, a better sense of the memberships from, uh, you know, from both uh, EMS and fire. So yeah, we actually, we, yeah, we actually, yeah, we actually requested um, from Ross and Phil sort of a list of members and, uh, that's what we'll go to Cheryl with armed with here's sort of the worst case scenario. So that's what we want to take a look at. People might be more willing to take advantage of it if it was somehow subsidized, you know, like Tom said, 25,000 is I know the going rate, but on the exchange, you can, you can do better than that. And you may be able to get federal subsidy. Yeah. I mean, if there was a way for the town to get some subsidy somehow, I, I just don't want to make this, a cost going forward to the town. I just, we want to avoid that if we can. I think the perks that we're setting up and the thanks that we're giving these guys are, it's a great step forward and it's going to help them recruit and retain their membership. I just don't want it to become a, a, a growing cost to the town. That's, that's the issue. And I think the board of finance is supportive as well, but they didn't want to see a lot of, a lot of costs going forward as, you know, especially during these kind of tight budgets. So the question is whether you do it at all. If it's twenty-five thousand dollars, you know, why do it at all? But you, I'm, I know you'd be looking to the, at that in committee. I think the the maybe the advantage of it is that when you're negotiating a rate, uh, you have greater strength in negotiating a better um, policy uh, coverage in a large group versus when you're on your own or, or you're on the exchange. So to the extent someone can bear that cost, that you know, yearly you know, amount, it may make sense. It's just an additional tool that we're trying to entice people uh, to, to join uh, and be a volunteer. So if it's something that they can afford, great. If not, I don't know what really the appetite of the town is to, as Steve was saying, you know, have this yearly recurring cost if we start, you know, throwing money towards it. I, that's just my general sense. Could I make a comment uh, in response to Mike? So, you know, because we're self-insured on both the Board of Ed side and the town, we don't negotiate with a carrier. We simply have our experience and then we allocate the cost. We also allocate it based upon the different unions because a, a police family, I think the average is about $33,000 and a, a uh, uh, public works family is about $22,000 for family coverage. Phil, Phil Shively, when he presented to the Board of Finance, made the comment that he's a self-employed person and self-employed people may pay up to $30,000 for their, for their plan for, their, for themselves. Um, whereas a, low, a lower income person could qualify for, uh, 
for the Connecticut, whatever the plan is called, which is the Connecticut version of Obamacare, um, and and, be, and get subsidized um, coverage. So it's really a situational thing as to what you otherwise would pay. So someone like Phil Shadwick would welcome the opportunity to be covered under the town's plan. And um, but the other thing is, even though you agree to pay the cost. As we as we experienced with the library, you know, we we had the library employees on the town insurance, and then we asked them to leave to go to the uh, Obamacare, and they didn't like the, uh, the coverage and the experience, so we brought them back on. But we've had relatively poor experience with the uh, with that employee population, so someone can be paying twenty two thousand dollars of the premium, but the um, we can have cases that are costing us a half a million dollars a year um, for the care you know, with, with various kinds of diseases. And uh, so it's something we have to carefully consider and understand the impact on the health plan if we bring in uh, a large population of, uh, I think there's 50 or so ambulance EMS uh, volunteers and, and 25 uh, fire. And so a, in relationship to the town's 180 person plan, it's not an incident, you know, potential. If, the, if it's only a couple of firemen, that's one thing, but the, the EMS population is could bring in proportionally to the town employees a large number of people. I, I still think that the numbers that uh, Phil and Russ were talking about, you know, in their cohort, uh, you know, across their rosters, you know, is, you know, low single digits. And, you know, th again, you know, Tom, you know, to address your point you know this is the ask you know from uh, from russ and phil right and i think that all of us believe you know that you know the tax abatement you know is something that should be done and there are some other little perks you know with respect to you know uh, use of town facility and i think you know that at this point i'd push for saying that you know um anything we can do in order to help them with recruitment and retention is a good thing. And that the ratio of something to nothing is infinite. So let's just move it forward. And if things look like they're going to become bottlenecks, then maybe they fall by the wayside and we pick them up later. Well, if Phil says it would be persuasive to him, then I'm in. That's all I needed to know. Yeah, so we'll we'll have the uh, conversation, obviously, and and you know from the beginning, I want to make sure Kevin's included in it, and and Cheryl, just to see where we are, and you know if it's decided that it's it's a it's worthwhile to pursue this, we will. Maybe we parse it out into a separate uh, item, and we can deal with that separately, put in separate language, but we'll we'll figure it out. And uh, that's really the only part of the ordinance that's in question at this point. I think the rest of it is pretty straightforward and I think it has support you know across the board from Board of Finance and I don't know whether everybody I know Penny you sent a note and I, I apologize I don't know if everybody got to see the latest draft that we have working with but we'll get that out to everybody so they can sort of review it and be ready for uh, when we discuss this again any questions out there okay back to you John thanks Steve I think up next is Linda Yes, I'm going to go over the financial report, um, and you have that on your on your tablets. Uh, John, I think I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just so I can walk you through it. Are you able to do that? I am not. Not yet. Oh, now I can. Right. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, this is a two page document. The first page are the expenditure summaries and then the next page are the, um, the revenues. Uh, this is just an update to what I presented to you last month. I did a similar present presentation to the Board of Selectmen and the Town Council and the Board of Finance. And what I do in each, I update the, the projection numbers and the year to date numbers. So this is as of um, this, these are expenses as of Monday. So it's a little bit more current than the numbers you had from the from from what you saw 
at the Board of Finance meeting. Um, essentially, on the town side, as Kevin mentioned, uh, we are coming under budget, um, as we historically do. Some of it is due to salary savings that we've historically had even without COVID, but there are some expenses that we're just not incurring uh, because of COVID, uh, things like travel, things like office supplies, and those types of things, those are naturally going, going down. So if I start at the very top, the town department operations, which are just our operational expenses, uh, those right now we're projected to come in uh, just over, just under a million dollars um, from the current uh, revised budget. Our pension contributions, um, they are what they are, so those are fixed. Uh, they're calculated at the beginning of the year, so we're gonna do that at 100%. Our town health contributions, you'll see that in the revised budget, it shows 5.7 million. I've shared this information with you before, um, since we took on the library um, on, into our health insurance plan uh, for two successive years, we did not include uh, the contribution for those benefits and therefore we plan on making that correction this fiscal year. I'll be taking that to the Board of Finance in June. And therefore at this time, we upped the revised budget by additional million dollars to 5.7. Right now we've spent 4.7 and so we're projecting to spend that 5.7. Based on how we perform this year, we may actually not need to do a special appropriation for the additional million because we may have sufficient savings at the end of the year. And so we will still do the additional million dollar transfer, but we will do that from saving within the existing budget. Um, and so I don't anticipate that we will need that special appropriation but I put in there just as a budget number, so we do an apples to apples uh, comparison. So in total, you'll see what the total expenses are. The new line here, you'll see town COVID related expenses. Obviously these are uh, COVID expenses, but these are going to be reimbursed to the town. Uh, we will not see that reimbursement um, likely this fiscal year. We are working on getting those, um, the paperwork turned in for the reimbursement. A uh, year to date, we're at about 130,000, which includes a combination of overtime expenses, masks, um, and just general um, expenses related to COVID. So the projected is 225. This was obviously not budgeted in the year, so that's 225,000 expense. As Kevin mentioned, the next section, the Board of Ed, in speaking with Dr. Keating and Dr. Lutze, we're looking that uh, potentially they would come in at about three quarter million dollar under budget. Um, they do have COVID related expenses as well, um, similar to what the town is. However, um, as you know, Board of Ed has this general fund operation budget, but they also have a significant budget in their food services, uh, which is a self-funded fund. Uh, they have most of their COVID expenses are in their food services. Those are going to get reimbursed, but those are not accounted for in this budget. Uh, but they do have about fifty to sixty thousand dollars or so of COVID expenses related to food services. Those what will be kind of first. expenses are those? Say that again. What kind of expenses would they have that are COVID related that would not be part of their ordinary food service budget? Uh, we're feeding. We're feeding in addition to the hundred fifty or so kids that they feed, they feed uh, during the school year. We're feeding an, a number of um, seniors in uh, certain areas um, so that they don't have to leave their, their homes. Um, I, I knew we were feeding more seniors, but I thought we were feeding less students. Not true? No, no. They have, they, they're, 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 they're feeding, they're feeding the, the students that they would normally feed, but they're also, for example, they took over the Meals on Wheels program, which was about 42 people. And then we have another, I don't know, maybe 100, uh, seniors in various locations that are uh, being fed through the Board of Education. And and you're saying that that is reimbursable? Well, that's what the guidelines are. You know, the, the state, Connecticut has 1.2 or $3 billion from the Federal CARES Act to uh, for, for COVID um, relief. And uh, we also have uh, FEMA funds that are 75% um, reimbursable. So, you know, as in, as in prior, um, you know, the expectation is people will get reimbursed a lot for their COVID related expenses of this type. Great, thank you. And Ke Kevin, that 225, or Linda, the 225, that 100% of that is, will come back? 
Uh, again, it all depends on how much other claims there are in the, on that billion three that the right. state has. And also, um, also how much FEMA, I don't think is limited, but it, it's, uh, we're in 75% reimbursement area and not 100% like New York State. Thanks. But a majority of that will get reimbursed, Mark. Linda, I, Linda, I don't know if the, if the uh, superintendent or Joanne have been in touch with you since Monday, but Monday night in the Board of Ed meeting, Rich and I listened in, they are talking about actually the number may reach as, as much as a million four with some unknown offsets for expenses. But the, the topic that they're wanting to bring to us at some point, uh, and certainly to the Board of Finance at the next meeting is, is the question of how they would fund the, the preparation of getting the schools open in the fall, assuming that they're permitted to do that. And they would be extensive because of social distancing and all the protections. And they said a lot of the purchasing that they would have to do for that would, because the, the supply lines are so, uh, there's so much competition for the kinds of goods that they would require that they wanna be able to do that with quick turnaround. So I think that they may be coming and asking for a, a special arrangement where there's a, I think what they're calling a non-relapsing fund where they will be able to use the million four or whatever the appropriate number is uh, to make purchases for the fall, even though it straddles the two budget years. So we'll, we'll learn yes, more. That, yeah, you're, you're correct. Um, and Joanne and I did have, did have okay. that discussion uh, because the saving is potentially more than the 750. And so the 750 nets out what those other anticipated expenses could be. But again, it, a lot of those expenses are unknown because of the sourcing and because of the high demand for those products and the short supply, which is obviously going to impact the price. So the 750 is an estimate. It could be that number. Um, it could be slightly less, slightly more. But it does factor into account that there will be added expenses just to retrofit the facilities for the new normal when the kids return next year. Uh, and I believe there's a committee of the board that's been created to kind of manage that process. So it's, poss it's possible that the 750 is not returned to the town by the end of the, uh, by the end of the fiscal year, but in fact gets spent. Yes, because what I understand is their anticipated savings are in excess of the 750. And so they're saying that after you take down oh. those other expenses, only 750 may be returned. But again, that 750 may still go down, okay. but this has already initi initially assumed that there will be a portion of that that will get spent this fiscal year. Okay. Um, but again, we'll, we'll know more um, next month. Uh, the other expenses are, are um, pretty much on track as you saw last time. The one thing I would like to highlight in the tax supported capital, you see that there's a $235,000 decrease from, from what we've actually spent here to date. Last week, the Board of Finance um, reviewed projects that are being closed. Um, those projects were appropriated for, they've been completed, but they did not fully expend their budget authority. Projects came in under budget. And so a combined savings of those projects was about 235,000. And so what the Board of Finance did was um, to net out that reduction in by way of savings in this fiscal year, so that those unspent funds from that tax supported project will be used to fund projects that were funded in this fiscal year. So we're basically taking that 235 as a saving in this fiscal year. So that's where that's coming from. Because we have closed projects that are closed out, have funds unspent, and therefore we're gonna use those unspent dollars to fund projects this fiscal year. So there's 235,000 that's gonna come back to the general fund by way of savings because of using unexpended funds from that project. So we'll have that money come, come back. Uh, we had some reductions in debt service, largely the result of the refunding uh, that we recently did. Um, and when we approved the budget, the debt service numbers were, were somewhat an estimate and therefore combination between actual principal and interest payments coming in below and the net impact of the refunding there's some savings there. And therefore, in total, we're looking at underspending in the general fund. If you include the special appropriation by about 2.1, if you back out the special appropriation, about 1.1. So either way, the general fund will underspend in total 
from the approved budget, which is typical in most in most deals. Linda, quick question. I sure. should have asked this a long time ago, but what's BOE carryover? BOE carryover is um, at the end of the year, and this happens on the town side as well, when the auditors come through, there are expenses that are encumbered in the current year that are paid in the following fiscal year. Okay. So the auditor sends us this number. It could be legal bills. It could be things that you've incurred, but the bills are not yet due until the following fiscal year. So those expenses are carried over. You save the money in the prior year, but you incur the expense in the following year. So that's what the carryover amount is. Okay. So this year, last year, this year on the town side, we carried over about 40,000, and then the BOE had about 237,000. But these were budgeted for in the prior year. You just don't spend them in that year. You spend them in the following year. And Linda, the uh, town library operation contribution? I mean, yes. Isn't there some savings there now that they've been closed for a couple months? Well, if there are any savings, those are on the library side. Uh, but we fund the library at at a hundred percent, and therefore, if they if there are to be savings, those are saved on on their end. It doesn't necessarily mean a, re a reduced contribution on our end, as per existing uh, as per the existing arrangement. Okay. <laughs> but good question. Maybe something to revisit to uh, to revisit. And then on the on the revenue side, um, this is where there's slightly more to explain on, on this end. So historically, we've always had higher tax collections that come in year over year, and therefore this year is no different. At the very first line, you're seeing that we budgeted 139 million in tax collections with a 98 and a half collection rate. When the COVID pandemic started, we had already gone through the December. Uh, receipts and the July receipts of last year. So most of our tax revenue has not been impacted by COVID in this fiscal year. So we've, we are going to collect about a million and one uh, over what we typically budget, which is historic. Uh, prior year collections, as you know, we have years where taxes from prior year are paid in the current year. We had a budget of 350 year to date. We've already collected 690 of that. Um, as I mentioned at the last meeting, there was one taxpayer who was lagging behind. That taxpayer was contacted and 350 of that almost is from one taxpayer um, who had just overlooked. Um, and so that, that amount came in. So those two things um, help us in terms of collecting additional excess revenue. Our investment income was budgeted at 800,000 at the beginning of the year. Uh, we've already collected in excess of a million dollars. Again, this was pre, um, earnings pre-COVID, and therefore we're anticipating over-collecting on those items. And then our education cost-sharing grant, this is what we see from the state. If you recall at the beginning of the year, because of the uncertainty of the state funding, we did not budget for 100% revenue. We budgeted at 75%. The state has actually honored their commitment to 100%. So we're collecting, we've already received 100% of the ECS money already and therefore that accounts for that um, over collection in that area. So that bodes well for the town. However, on the flip side is we do have other revenue sources that are not doing um, so well and are coming in under. And the biggest one I'll start off with, um, I'll start off with at the top, our tipping fees, uh, we had budgeted 445, obviously with, what, with what's going on those are not coming in at, at the level. So we're right now we're projecting we'll come in about $75,000 below on tipping fees. The Board of Ed excess cost grant, we had initially budgeted a million dollars prior to the calculation. The calculated amount is about 917 and therefore we'll, we'll come in slightly under, but it is still the full allocation from the state. Our building permits is where we're getting a, a, a hit. We had budgeted 900,000 um, so far year to date in May. We've collected 500. Um, in talking to Bill uh, Brian, uh, we're at estimating to come in at 600, which is about 300,000 below uh, budgeted revenues. Similarly, we started seeing this trend in conveyance fees just because of transactions. 
and real estate transactions have gone down. We had a budget of 1.2 million. Right now, we're estimating to come in at just under a million dollars. So that's almost a $300,000 drop in revenues in that line item. And then the other big one are our parking permits, fees, and tickets. And therefore, the total budget for this is 1.3 million. But of that 1.3 million, about 650,000 is our parking permits in our commuter lots. Typically, we bill for those in May. And the way that that revenue comes in, we get the revenue in May, June, and July. About 450 of that comes in May and June. And therefore, we were anticipating that to happen. But obviously, with the commuter people not commuting, um, and I believe the Parking Commission and the First Selectmen and the Board of Selectmen are also considering waiving uh, those parking permits and giving us um, some grace some to those permit fees. And therefore, the revenues, the 450000 that we would typically get in May and June, we are not uh, projecting to get that revenue. And therefore, that, that's a significant hit in terms of overall revenue. And therefore, if you look at the total revenue picture, we are still collecting more revenues than what we had budgeted because the tax collections are making up for the deficits in all of these other revenues. In a typical year, we would benefit from the over collections in taxes plus the budgeted revenue in all of these other programs had we not been um, getting, getting less in those revenues. So if you recall at the beginning of each year, we had budgeted to draw down the fund balance by $3 million in this fiscal year, which is typical in all in previous fiscal years. We typically don't draw down the $3 million because one, we over collect and we underspend. And therefore, the net of those makes up for that $3 million swing. This year, because of the revenues and the expense scenario, we will underspend, we will over collect, but the swing does not is not big enough to make for the $3 million budgeted fund balance drawdown. So at this point, we're anticipating drawing down the fund balance by about 1.4, which will leave us with about $29 million or so in, on the fund balance. And therefore, fast forwarding to last Tuesday when the Board of Finance met to set the mill rate and to set the fund balance amount to be spent in the next fiscal year, they took this into account and as a result of this, they revised their fund balance drawdown from the five million to four and a half million for this upcoming fiscal year, just so that we would have sufficient reserves to meet any unforeseen expenses coming up um, as a result of, of some of these things that, that are going on. So with that four and a half million dollar fund balance drawdown for next fiscal year, the mill rate, uh, for next year that was set will be 18.164, which is this number here, which is less than the 18.24 for the current year. So the mill rate is actually going down about half a percent this year. And the amount to be raised from taxation is also going down this year. Um, and I think uh, Todd did a great job. You've probably read his, um, his uh, annual letter which um, summarizes a lot of what I said and where we're going. But that is just um, my update um, to you. Um, and again, we'll keep revising these numbers. When I come back to you in June, we will have updated our year-to-date numbers and we'll also update our, our year and projections. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Okay, that's all I have, John, on this item. Thank you, Linda. I guess there's no questions. Let's go back to our, uh, let's see, continue. I can't find my agenda. There's the agenda. Financial update, East School Roof Project. That's also you, Linda. Yes, so you have two projects, um, and I believe you, you will vote on each of these separate, but I'll cover both. Uh, Tiger is also on the call um, to answer specific project related, but I'll just talk about the financing piece. So the e-school roof is uh, two million, two, two million, two million two thousand um, for this project. Um, and you've seen this before; it's been discussed before. 
As Kevin mentioned before, because of the governor's executive order, with these, with these two resolutions, you'll see that there's an added section, which is section 10. And this is a new section that we typically have not included in prior resolutions. And basically, because the executive order, um, the executive order puts a hold, for lack of a better word, on, on referendums. And therefore, typically, all of these bond issues, citizens would have the ability to referendum. However, what Section 10 does is, if the exception was that if the town council can make a finding that these projects coming before you uh, meet a couple of, a couple of criteria. Uh, one is that these projects are necessary to permit the orderly operation of the municipality, um, and then that they are emergency projects uh, that avoid endangering the public health and welfare, and in not doing so at this time will, doing them at this time will prevent significant financial loss uh, moving forward. And therefore, in discussing with Bond Council, uh, it is felt that uh, the roof project and the bridge project both meet, 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 that, meet those requirements uh, for the finding. And therefore, in approving these resolutions, not only will you be approving the authorization of the project and the authorization to bond, but you would also be approving the finding that these two projects meet uh, meet those um, meet those criteria. Don, scroll down to scroll down in the uh, resolution to see ten or eleven. I thought it was eleven. Ten. That's as long as it goes. Ten. So that's that's a special finding. I think I think the next one may be eleven, but. Um, Something. No, both of those are 10. Okay. Both of those are section 10. So is Sandy Dawson on? Uh, she is, but she said I, I can call her so she can unmute herself. So let me do that. I'm on. Oh, there you go, Sandy. Sandy yeah, so Linda made a good presentation of this. You know, I, I, this is kind of a technical thing in your ability to give a clean, clean bond opinion. Um, do you want to just say a few words about what the finding is that the town council has to make here? He's still muted. I made her a co-host so she can unmute herself. I've now unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, New Canaan is in a unique situation where you have a town council that approves um, bond resolution. So this finding paragraph really only is used if you were to get a successful petition. Uh, unlike other you know, towns that either take all, take all their resolutions to town meeting or referendum, um, in which case the voters' you know, rights are being taken away from doing that vote. So just to um, clarify a bit um, based on what was said, um, I did not make a decision that I, and I'm not recommending that, that these findings are met, I want to make sure you know that I'm, I'm telling you that if, I thought they were strong enough that if the town council could make this finding, I could give a clean, um, unqualified bond opinion that these resolutions were validly adopted um, and, and authorized. Um, when, you know, so I could give that opinion to the bondholders. Actually, um, actually, so that, explain that, you oh, know, that, so bond council's view is that the governor's order is unconstitutional. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you want me to go through that. Yeah, yeah and, I'll start with that. And, there, um, and, there, and therefore, in order, and the expectation was that the assembly is going to ratify the governor's, uh, but the, in order for you get, to give a clean opinion, you have to, you have to get over that potential argument that the governor's order is unconstitutional. Yeah, so interestingly, um, all of the bond council firms in, in Connecticut, we got together for a conference call and um, to talk about it because we all agreed that um, this, this particular executive order is, would likely be found unconstitutional um, uh, because of the, the whole, for a lot of reasons, the home rule statute, the fact that, you know, voters' rights are being taken away, et cetera. Um, however, we do, 
each for each of us, the firm, the bond council firm, then we went away. You know, we just had that one conference call and we had to make a decision whether we could give a bond opinion. And um, my firm, there's seven of us, seven bond attorneys in the firm, and uh, we did our own research and talking with the firm and making sure that we we would be able to give this opinion and we were fine with giving it um, based, you know, on our malpractice insurance and everything. Uh, and the reasoning is that we know one, that um, legislatures have told us that we've talked to personally, that they will be ratifying all of the governor's actions at some point when they get together. Um, we don't know when, but that will happen. Um, and then secondly, even if that isn't good enough, we believe that no court would ever find this bond resolution unconstitutional based on other case law and you know what was done in, in uh, reasonable and in good faith, and they would not overturn it. So that's our, our firm's opinion, and that means that we are willing to give an unqualified bond opinion to the bondholders. Um, so, Sandra, if I if we make the motion, you know, to authorize the resolution as we usually do, and we add something like, and further, we the town council find this is an emergency affecting public health and welfare. Does that satisfy what we need to do tonight? Um, yeah, let me just look quickly at the uh, at number ten. So, John, scroll back down. So the way this is written is that um, that you feel that there's a need, you know, to immediately. Uh, excuse me. Just one more page. That it. So the first thing is that it's necessary to permit the orderly operation of the town. Right. Okay? And that there's a, and that there's a need to act during the duration of this emergency preparedness period, which is through September 9th, correct, right now. That's why I said it's uh, an emergency. Yeah, and so that's number one, meet that, and then and, and the next things are all ors, and in order to avoid endangering public health and welfare, that's an or, you don't that's have to have I that. That's what I said. Or, yep, prevent significant financial loss, that's, it could be one, of, could be that one, or it could be that the action is otherwise necessary for, for protection of persons and property. You know, I mean, my thinking, and of course, this is what the town council has to decide. But my thinking was is that um, look, this roof um, is of an, you know going to protect people. And uh, after, oh, excuse me, we're doing the bridge first. Are we doing the bridge first or the roof? The roof. Okay, uh, it's in a school. It can be done more safely now to protect the students, but because there's environmental concerns in there, there's going to be some remediation. It can all be done while the school is closed. Um, and it'll, per, you know, permit you to prepare for when the school building is reopened. That was my thinking on it. You may think that it also meets other parts of this. Um... Yeah, yeah it I guess it could financial loss in addition in that you've already got a, um, a, a letter of intent with a contractor. You already went through the expense of bidding this out. Uh, you already have the contractor that uh, has been conditionally awarded the bid. Uh, and is ready to go. Um, and so I guess partially you could say it's a financial loss because if you waited and rebid it out, um, we, you don't know what the construction field, you know, exactly. will be later, be busier and you might get have to pay more. I don't know. So, that, I don't know if that, uh, so let me try this. Let me make a motion that uh, the town council is resolved that we authorize an appropriation of $2,002,000 for the East School Roof 2020 project and the financing of said appropriation by the issuance of general obligation bonds of the town and notes in anticipation of such bonds in an amount not to exceed $2,002,000. And that we further find that this is an emergency affecting public health and welfare and to protect municipal property. Sven, that last part's already in the language. You don't need the last part. It's in 10. Correct, you don't need to repeat number 10. Okay, so we don't need to make that explicit. Okay, fine. No. I just wanted to make it explicit in the motion. That's all, but that's fine. 
I'll second it, Sven. Okay. Yep. Okay. Any um, question? I have a question, um, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but and I'm all for spending the money to 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 get the roof fixed. I'm just maybe I missed it, but why are we talking about? Why is there reference to the uh, governor's order when we were this was something that was on our radar quite some time ago, and we thought it was a fine expense to um, you know a fine process to move through? Uh, because one. because the public is not allowed to referendum, and so therefore the governor has said because the public can't referendum, you have to call it an emergency. So we're consciously saying, is this something that is sufficiently emergency that we, we uh, would be endangering the public's health if we put it off? And that's what's in front of us. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. Then just the second question is uh, from uh, the council, um, Ms. Dawson. Um, you said that your firm uh, is, is comfortable issuing this opinion to us. Has it done so in writing? No. I, I, well, I, I said it to um, Kevin, and I'm not sure if I backed it up with an email. Um, I have internal writings, you know, that we, are, we, are, we will give when you issue the bond. Now, one thing I'll say is, oh, go ahead, um, is that you can, you know, you can adopt any resolution you want right now without this, knowing that if a successful petition is brought, that the town council will then have to have a referendum. Right. I, I just think that for the town council's purposes, uh, to be able to, I think, firmly rely on uh, opinion of council, and I certainly appreciate the call that you're making. Um, I just don't know if it's sufficient for the town council, even right now, to just, uh, to, you know, rely on the statements made during the public hearing. I mean, we probably can, but I just, my opinion is it, it, we really should have something, you know, in writing, you know, on letterhead from the firm saying, look, this is our, you know, we researched it, this is our opinion, and here you go. That's my thought anyway. Mike, I'm certainly happy. Mike, bond, council's, you know, opinion, bond council's opinion is really for the benefit of the, of the, of the lenders, bond buyers, and not, not the town, so that, um, and the bond buyers don't want to don't want a qualified opinion. So the opinion will be issued at the time bonds are issued. Right, well, I understand. I think what he's asking now is how if being issued means it's it's something we need to consider and rely upon. So I, I you know I just it just makes sense to me to have something like that in writing. Or else why are we discussing it in this hearing? But I don't think Sandy's offering to give us an opinion that it's wise to adopt this resolution. I think she's saying that if we do adopt the resolution, she can opine to investors that it conforms, you know, but we make the fact judgment. Okay. And right, but language, this language that's in this agreement, I don't, there's no need to have a, a huge dispute about it. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. I'm just saying that the fact is this language is in here and we're discussing it and the, the providence of the language is being explained to us. Um, so, and why it's appearing in here. So I, I just don't see why that would be, why we, why we shouldn't have that. But if you guys don't want it, then that's fine. I, I don't, need, we don't need to continue to argue about it. Okay, any further discussion? We I, have... I just want, I would, John, I would go on the, on the record that we've discussed that e-school roof at length at many different meetings and the Board of Ed has articulated the need for the e-school roof. I've, I've seen it. I've actually been through the e-school uh, area and know that it's, it needs to be done. It's the envelope that will save that school. There's mediation stuff going on there. We've got to do it. It's a public safety issue. There's no question about it. And, and you know, I, I know all of us are, are behind the board of ed in terms of getting this done. And we need to do it now when the kids aren't there. And it, it's clear that this is something that we need to do. So I'm 100% for it. And obviously on the bridge side of it, it's a bridge that people are driving over. That's and that's a bridge that we've studied and know that it's no good. It's not. It's a safety. It's a huge issue with fire trucks. We've talked about that. I mean, these two projects—they're both no-brainers. We've got to do them both. So let's go. I agree with Steve. Agree. Who is this? I like it when Steve gets fired up. <laughs> All right, we have a motion, we have a second, end of discussion. If there is no further discussion, can I- Hang on, Tom's got something. What? 
Tom's got his hand up. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch who the second was. I heard a voice, but I didn't get a name. That was me, Tom, Steve Carl. Steve, okay. All in favor, raise your hand. And, and say, so I have John, Penny, Rich, Tom, Robin, Mark, Maria Naughton, Liz, Sven, Mike, Steve. So I be, it's 11 out of 11. So the motion passes. Uh, now we, we need a second motion for the second bond. Uh, you want me to start? <laughs> yes, please. You're on a roll. Okay, as the town council, we resolved to authorize an appropriation of $2 million for the West Road Bridge 2020 project and financing of said appropriation by the issuance of general obligation bonds of the town and notes in anticipation of such bonds in an amount not to exceed $2 million. And we further find that this is an emergency uh, affecting public health and welfare. Second. Steve? I'll go again, yeah. <laughs> Discussion. Come on, give me a, an impassioned speech, Steve. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Come on, guys. I mean, the bridge, the bridge is collapsing. Let's go. I mean, I don't even know what the, what the issue is here. Come on, let's go. Can I ask a question? We were all just waiting for it. Yeah. Uh, just to hold up, Steve. No, I, the the two million dollars. Uh, if I understand this property, part of this gets reimbursed by the state. Yes. How much? I believe it's estimated at one million, right, Tiger? Half. The fifty-fifty split, Rich. Okay, uh, so the and the mechanics of that uh, is we borrow two million dollars, and then they take over half of the bond. No. Or, no we just own the issue. We authorize the two million, and we only issue exactly what we need for for the spend. Okay. Which is out so, for bid right now, so we're hoping it actually comes in a little bit less. But the thought too is that we have to cover the entire amount in case you know the state has issues. We still have to do the bridge. We got to cover the entire amount. But we have a letter of we have a letter from the state saying that they're granting us fifty percent, and it's it falls underneath that grant program. Okay, but if they decided for some reason they didn't want to want to uh, to they ran out of money and they couldn't do the other half, we're on the hook for the other half. Theoretically, yes. Okay. Rich, the way that the way that these resolutions are structured, they're in two parts. Part one is the appropriation for the project, and therefore we're appropriating the full project cost. Mm -hmm. And then section two is the financing, is where the money comes from. And you'll see that in section two, it's written that 50% will come from, from the state with the balance uh, being bonded by the town. And this is true for all other projects. Uh, you know, there's some projects where we get grant donations from local charities and local nonprofits. We, we do a similar resolutions. Um, so the first part is the appropriation, which is 100% of the project. And then the second part is the financing. So that's just, why it's two million and not one. But, but just to make sure I understand it, we're going to sign a contract for two million dollars, Tiger. Well, whatever the bid is, but yes. What, whatever the bid is, we're going to sign it, and we're on the hook for it. If the state doesn't come through, we're on the hook for it. We have an agreement at that point in time. The state looks through the 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 state is uh, part of the entire bid review process, and then they sign off on their portion as well so we have an, a, an agreement right now we have an agreement with them for you know 50 percent of the funding based upon the estimate of construction at present uh then we go back to them with the with the true bid amount and then they amend the agreement to those numbers okay and then they pay the bill they pay their half of the bill when it comes in they reimburse us yes they, they reimburse us that's correct we have to we have to submit for reimbursement yeah. oh, which is normal Right. That is a that is a, that's a typical method. Okay, but but if they don't have the money, we we pay the bill. But yeah, I'm just pointing the risk out. I, uh, yeah. well, we, right? we, every other town would be in the exact same situation, right? So right. It's not, not just the one, but the 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 money. You know, some of this money is subsidized by the federal government, not just by the state. So it's a little bit more secure. Mm -hmm. No further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. 
I see one, two, three, four, five, or I should say the names. John, Penny, Rich, Tom, Robin, Mark, Maria, Liz, Sven, Mike, and Steve makes 11 out of 11 votes. So the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. John, can I ask a question of Sandra? At this yes. Point? Uh, Sandra, so looking ahead, and this is not something we need to, we would in any event decide tonight, but looking ahead to the possibility of wanting to uh, fund the library project. Now let's assume for the moment that there is no case that it's an emergency. Uh, is it really clear that given the fact that New Canaan's legal process does not require a referendum? Tom, Tom I, don't, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask uh, our attorney to Okay. To speculate on something that's not before her. All right. Well, you were talking about it earlier, so. Well, John asked about the schedule, but that's me talking about facts, and I don't think it's appropriate to be asking. Okay. Well, maybe the qu the question to you then, Kevin, is we're, we should not assume that there's a barrier at this point. We don't necessarily need to assume there's a barrier to financing the library under these executive orders. It may or may not be. I'm not going to find either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll say it then. I don't, I don't think there's a barrier. We'll see. I don't believe we'll we're see. crossing bridges before you have to cross them. So. Okay. Even the one we just funded, right? <laughs> no, I think, I, I think what um, we heard was we have, we have got to, this, if, if the library shows up in front of us, we're going to see a paragraph 10 and we're going to have to make a judgment. I'm just saying I'm not uh, sure that's necessary. I would like to speak on that what you just said, um, Mr. Engel, because I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if there's confusion, but this executive order does not prohibit you from bringing your resolutions in your normal way. Any town or city can bring a resolution like you always do. It's just that if you're in a town that has to have a referendum, then they're going to make provisions to have it. So long as the, lo the local health district or the state is consulted as to how you've been accomplished, or if you're in a town with a town council, then if you get a successful petition, you will have to, you can then, you know, you will then have to plan that referendum. And if it's during the emergency preparedness period, you can have it as long as you consult with your local health district or the state and get their help with coming up with a, a safe process that, that you know, to, to get it done. You know, th this has been quite controversial in other towns because some towns have, you know, a town meeting form of government and capital projects go for a vote every year. And, uh, and, and so it's not just a referendum. It's, 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 it's so the, the governor's order being, again, in, in the opinion of not just Sandy's firm, but other firms unconstitutional, it creates a problem for issuing bonds when you have to give a clean, clean opinion. And that they're looking for a way to solve this by one factually having you premise it on something that addresses the emergency that the governor has declared, and secondly, to um, hopefully have the assembly ratify what the governor's order does so that it's, it's unimpeachable. Because uh, people who lend money want to know that some people are not going to make a legal argument as to why they, they don't they, they they don't have to be paid back. There, there has been one town in Connecticut that has already held a successful town meeting, um, which I thought was very interesting, That's the way they did it. So can um, I but they have down to one sentence? I think that, so what I heard, Tom, was that either one of two things is going to happen. Either the town council will take it up with a paragraph 10, deeming an emergency, or the town council will take it up not as an emergency, but pave the way with a path for the citizens, telling the citizens what the path is to challenge it, town meeting, referendum, whatever it is. So it's either not challengeable and gets a paragraph 10, it's an emergency, or we have to sort of uh, let the public know what that path is uh, to, for, for challenging it. Um, those are the two ways that something like a library could come could could make its way through the system. Is that is that correct, Sandra? Uh, yes, More. although I'm not or I'm not sure you have to specifically educate anybody uh, on any specific project because the charter 
is available to the public and it, and it spells out the exact timeline um, that once you publish that you've passed it, uh, they know that they now have eight days to file a notice of petition and they have 30 days from that publication to get that petition together with 5% uh, of the voters' signatures. Um, so you can do whatever you want. You can do more education or, or expect that people know there's a, there's a charter. It's not only theoretical. I know of at least one citizen, and maybe it's only been one, who asked whether that project and other projects could be challenged. He was sent to the town clerk, and she said to him that, uh, that, that, that there were no referendums possible this year. So if that's not true any longer, we do have to educate the public as to what the current status is. So that, that's why I'm saying there is confusion because true. citizens yeah. have asked the question. That's the answer they got. That is not true. So yeah. That's the answer that's, they that's got. But this was two months ago when at the beginning and maybe things have changed. Sure. Yeah, there was a lot of confusion at the beginning with these executive orders. And by the way, I don't blame her. But could, can I just clarify what, what the thing, I, I heard something different than this, and that is if we don't have a paragraph 10, Sandra will not give us a clean opinion and we will have trouble marketing the bond. Oh, no, no. If you do not have a paragraph 10, then that means you've adopted in the normal way. And of course, I can give an opinion. Not a problem at all. Okay. And your opinion you would be clean. Oh, yes. Yeah. It would because okay. you wouldn't be, you would not be even using the executive order. Um, you'd just be taking the risk that you would have to set so, up a referendum. So this is effective, effectively allowing us to take advantage of the governor's uh, uh, gift of letting us block a referendum. Well, that's the purpose of the of the executive order, and I and I think that uh, you know should be taken in the spirit it was given, which is. If you've got a problem and you've got a, you know, that has to be done and you can meet these findings in good faith, then, then you know, go ahead. By the way, my opinion is we can. So I, it's, this is theoretical in my mind. It's why I asked the question, Tom, whether, whether we're going to even see this in the next month or two so that we wouldn't have to have this conversation. They're not going to bring it in front of us. We've got time. <laughs> Right, Kevin, you're not, it's not coming in front of us next month. We can, you can take the summer off, yeah. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may have a special meeting in August. <laughs> just to punish it, just to punish us. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? I know, I'm glad you asked the question, Tom. I'm glad Sandra was able to clarify. I'm glad Rich clarified it further. Uh, I'm glad, I think it's an important subject. I do think it's important that we have this conversation in front of the public to educate the public our best understanding of whether referendums are possible, necessary, and what is the challenge, what is the path to challenge any of our decisions. Uh, they do have that right, I think. Um, that being said, I think we're up to committee reports, right? Uh, John, do you still need Sandy to stay on the call or can we, can we leave her? You, no, Sandra can leave. Uh, you can you can leave. Uh, Tiger can leave. Um, Kevin should probably stick around for the committee reports, but uh, I think everybody else can go home. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. With, with our thanks. My pleasure. It's very nice to meet you all for the first time. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Thanks, Sandy. So, are there any committee reports? Hey, Linda, you got the opportunity to go home. <laughs> You're home already. <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> All right. So bylaws and ordinances, Mark and Steve, we, we covered that earlier. Yes? Yeah. Yes. You heard from us. That, that's it from us. Conservation, Robin and Rich. Any news? Um, just the Conservation Commission. Um, just they're uh, continue. They're going to start the river testing. Uh, river Watch is going to do the test on the Neroten. Um, Tiger's team is doing the Five Mile River. Um, and then just with Bristow Bird Sanctuary, uh, inland wetlands approval needed, or that happened on Monday. And then they're bidding for the next, next fiscal year if that happens. And Bristow is now on the Cornell School of Ornithology database as a hotspot. 
and that the land acquisition fund stands at 50,000. Hot spot is a good thing? Yes, it's a good thing. There's, they, I think they said in the meeting that they've now counted 56 species of birds in Bristow now. So when you're a hotspot, you have a lot of birds, not you are an endangered bird. No, not, not a COVID hotspot. It's, it's a good hotspot. Okay. <laughs> Robin, quick question. Is Go there ahead. an update on the, is it, what is it, the Sustain Connecticut? Or remember that thing we were trying to get, uh, get moving? The Sustainable Connecticut? Yeah, I that uh, they stopped for a while because of all of this. Now they're back on. I've been doing some classes. I'm going to get a um, meeting going hopefully for next week. I've been trying to reach out to people for um, what dates. Um, there's not that much we can do with things closed, unfortunately, and everything takes twice as long or three times as long. But there are two items I want to meet about. One being. Um, I went to a, I had a Zoom meeting about their sustainable um, community matching grant, which I think would apply to any, to uh, New Canaan projects. So I'd like to meet about that next week to get that out there as well as the um, trying to get someone to come explain our CPACE program, uh, commercial property assess clean energy to um, businesses, developers and nonprofits in town because uh, it's, in, it was implemented in 2014, but no one's actually used it yet. Um, and especially with natural gas coming through town, uh, you know, people could take advantage of that nonprofits to uh, upgrade and, and tap into that. So trying to get one of their speakers to come and maybe through the library, uh, get something going so they can answer questions to developers, businesses, nonprofits. Thank you. Education. We did talk a little bit about education already, but Tom, Maria, anything further? Maria? I think you said what I was, what I heard on, on the meeting. Oh, good. Excess and that account, that's a, a flexible account where the money carries over to next year, but uh, so I don't know where it stands, but they said they'll have over a million unspent, but they have some money that they think they want to be able to carry over to cover expenses next year. So for all accounts, we think they're doing a phenomenal job on distance learning, obviously not with the, the very young kids because they're not, they're not loving uh, relying on computer access, but uh, for most of the grades, just an excellent job. The, the thing that's the, uh, the overwhelming challenge now is, is, how do you open in the fall? We could talk about that for a while, but let's just say it's very complicated and it'll require an input from best, best thinking from around the world actually to, to structure it. But uh, we've got a great team. If anybody can do it, ours can. Well, I just saw something today that came from CABE and it was guidance for camps. And it, it actually showed a diagram of how the busing would look. And it was really incredible. I mean, they had students sitting every other seat um, crisscross. You could only have two in a seat if they were siblings. I mean, this was just the image for camp. So if we have to do something like that, my first thought was that would require a lot of buses. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't know what direction they'll take for the fall. Well, the one of the things that they're talking about is, is that um, the younger kids would go, possibly, this is just a possibility, f four days a week because they need, they're in greater need for the interpersonal relationships, but would use all the schools. Uh, and then one day a week, it would just be the older kids. Um, I think that, so on, on no given day, would you, on, on, or I should say on, on every given day, you would have a lot more buses at your disposal because you're only busing half of the population. So same number of buses could get you the spacing. At least that's the theory. Interesting. Uh, but yeah. I, I mean, just looking at the image, I think you'd need more buses, but we'll see. Maybe it'll change by the fall. I don't know. I guarantee okay. that it'll change. Maybe it's in government, Mark, Rich. Uh, just one one comment from me, Mark. You make a comment as as well if you want. We have had no subcommittee meetings since uh, 
since the last uh, town council meeting, but I have been interacting with the uh, Board of Finance. I believe that unlike last year, they're going to want to get together uh, after the budget is done here to address next year's budget because they're so concerned about the growth rates that are inevitable as a result of the amount of contingency that was put into this budget. Nothing more from me. Health and Human Services, Liz and Penny. I think the um, the, the general uh, sentiment is Health and Human Services is doing an extraordinary job um, in reaching out to um, the particularly the seniors in, in the population. Um, Everybody has been um, in the, that population has been contacted uh, with or without um, helpers uh, for food uh, deliveries um, or shopping, um, uh, pharmacy deliveries. Uh, I mean, it, and Lapham staff have had daily um, uh, emails out to everyone with activities um, that are really very stimulating. Uh, they're continuing to hold a number of classes via Zoom. Uh, so that uh, th this town is just really extraordinary. Yeah, and I would just say to second what, what Penny said, you know, Bethany Zara, who is our acting director, is that the right term, Penny? Yes. Uh, of Health and Human Services has really done an incredible job of coordinating all the volunteers and the local faith organizations and the Y and staying put and just pulling it all together. So it is, it is amazing. I'd say she does her work with not only incredible, incredibly productive, but does it with style and sensitivity. Being on the senior side of those discussions, I really appreciate how, how beautifully they do that. Uh, and remember, mm -hmm. they're actually still down two people, one person. <laughs> oh. Infrastructure, utilities, Penny. Uh, I think um, most of the report uh, Kevin already gave you, but um, you know, with the uh, wastewater treatment plant and the um, Eversource and the uh, Sachs project. Uh, the only other thing that was reported to the um, advisory committee was uh, the development of a uh, purchasing policy that is um, being developed with um, Tiger and uh, Lunda. Uh, it is still in draft form and uh, at the time that it becomes, um, um, you know, approved, um, you will certainly be um, apprised of the content. I thought Tiger or Wanda might say something since you said their names, but I think they're, uh, they're deciding not to say anything and that's fine. <laughs> um, land Youth and Recreation, Robin and Maria. Wait, do you want, um, um, well, uh, well, the Wave Any Conservancy, of course, um, went up again, went with Parks and Rec and was approved. Um, the tennis courts at the high school are open, uh, not Mead Park yet because of weather, they've been delayed, but the, the tennis courts are pretty much book solid. Uh, paddle will not be opened yet because it is a double sports. Uh, Steve Banco said he was waiting on the pool as to whether it'd be open. He's just waiting to hear guidance from the governor. Um, which was not, which was not part of the governor's four o'clock call today. And, uh, so we're going to, there's inquiries being made as to, whether pools whether, are June 20 or sooner. Yeah. Right. So Steve Banco said, I mean, the soonest it would be would be June, obviously wouldn't be in May. Um, so they're waiting to hear from that. Um, camps, what Steve said, is they're going to be limited to 30 children and no more than 10 in a group. Uh, the problem is if it's bad weather, there's only 10 children in a room. And if they're in a gymnasium, it can only be 10. It can't be 10 in one corner and 10 in the other. Uh, no concerts for the month of June. Uh, there was talk of a drive-in movie theater, possibly at Waveney. Um, Banco said he was looking to bring in two to three movies for the summer uh, with about 200 cards could be possible. Um, oh, there was a question regarding the goats coming back. They will. Um, they're just <laughs> delayed. At, that's at Irwin. 
and um Oh, and the other thing is just the pickleball at Meek Park, the hard tennis court, you know, the one up above. Um, it can't be resurfaced due to damage from trees. The asphalt is failing, so a concrete base needs to be built, and then they'll turn those into pickle courts. Uh, public safety, Liz, Mike. I don't have anything. Do you, Mike? <laughs> public safety is pretty much wrapped up right now. <clears throat> excuse me, with the uh, ordinance that we're working on, the property tax abatement. Uh, but uh, there's just a comment that I'd like to make, and, and I may, this may have been um, stated in an email, but I just want to say, John, your 4 p.m. calls every day are just absolutely phenomenal. Um, in chatting with friends and other municipal workers in other towns, um, they seem kind of jealous that we have something like that nature of conveying information that's highly relevant on a daily basis. Um, so kind of uh, you holding court every day it's been it's been great catching it when i've been able to and kevin you know you're there and, and slugging away and really providing all the information that we need so i've been really truly impressed by it and i think it's been fantastic and a lot of people are very very happy that we have uh, that kind of coordination and input from from everybody from the first selectman from the board of ed folks from everybody so i just wanted to say on a public safety standpoint i think it's been phenomenal so thanks for running that and, Kevin, thanks for all your input there. Thank you. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kevin. Amazing. I see Tiger on that call every day. Oh, Boy, Tiger too, of course. Sorry, Tiger. Then we'll leave you out. Right. Right. Tiger, do you spend your whole life on Zoom now? <laughs> yeah, every day too. You know, all day, every day. All right. Well, I don't want to spend one more minute of Tiger's time on Zoom. So if there's nothing further, shall we... Shall we adjourn the meeting? Oh, uh, just it's EMS week this week, National EMS week. So maybe we give a shout out to the EMS workers. It's also DPW week, isn't it? Or? Well, it's National Public Works week. Yeah. Appreciate National Public Works week. Yay, yes. public works. That's a big week, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good night all. All right, good night, good night. all. Good night. Good night. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Raise your hand. Oh, it's unanimous. Okay, we're adjourned. Bye, everybody. Be well. Bye. Thank you.